Hi, this is Misha, and in kind of our continuing coverage of guns with the newer equipment, we thought we would revisit the Austro-Hungarian guns of the Austrian half of World War I period. We have the 1898 Rost Gasser. We have the 1900 Seamus. Okay, buddy. We have the 1907, often called the Roth Steyr, although some insist Roth Krinka. And we have the 1911 or 1912 Steyr Hahn. <laughs> Hello, Seamus. He's usually not this friendly. So we'll get into these and uh, talk about their service history a bit. And I'm going to move a cat now because I need to be able to use this. It's my wife's cat. He got sick a few months ago and ever since he recovered, uh, he was on death's doorstep, ever since he recovered he's been much friendlier. So at least he's appreciative of the vet bills, huh? <laughs> you don't hear a lot about the guns of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, at least the handguns. Most people know of the Steyr 1895, the Manlicker, the straight pole. But they're very interesting because they were domestic designs. The Ross Gasser 1898 here was the last in a long line of revolvers developed by August Ross. The other ones were in black powder. This is one of the first in smokeless and the first to be used in smokeless. It fired an 8 by 27 rast cartridge. So very long and quite a small diameter. I'm going to point this at you that day and time. The reason they went with this was twofold. One, they were really going for penetration. In the late 19th century with the new smokeless powder, they were mindful of penetration and they were thinking about going through armor. This is kind of one of the very, very earliest uh, body armor using the form of helmets, maybe breastplates, and also mechanized vehicles. Obviously, tanks didn't exist at this time, but I guess they could see the writing on the wall. You know, steel plating was starting to be a thing, fortresses. So they were thinking about, they were thinking about how to, um, you know, have a, but well, really a more modern cartridge. Small diameter, higher velocity, better penetration over just brutal force. So they tested this out in the late 19th century and adopted it. Oh, I'm sorry, and the other uh, benefit, instead of having a six round capacity cylinder because of the smaller diameter, we have an eight. So an eight shot revolver. And we are a double single action. Interestingly, the firing pin is mounted in the frame rather than on the hammer. Kind of a very modern design that most other manufacturers would not go to for a long time. But we're still a loading gate gun. See here? So it's kind of an interesting mix of old and new, like a lot of guns in this period. So we have the rod and the loading gate, but at the same time, we've got a very modern firing pin system and a very modern cartridge. You can't pull the hammer back, as you see, with the gate, which is good. Flip it up. Now I can't. Pretty neat. We're a relatively big gun. This weighs just shy of a kilogram, so just shy of 2.2 pounds. Especially, it's actually over a kilo when loaded fully. We're at about eight and a half inches, excuse me, 8.8 .8 inches, eight and three quarters long. We do have about a 4.7 inch barrel, so relatively long. We're pretty wide because of the cylinder, and it's unfluted as you see. We have a very vertical grip, which will be a trend continued for some time in these Austrian guns. So anyway, as I was saying, it was adopted and went into production at the Gasser factory. Hence the name Ras Gasser, 
Rass being the designer, Gasser being the owner of the factory that manufactured it. And this would be standard issue throughout the Austro-Hungarian military, especially the Austrian part, before and into World War I. Between 19, 1898 and 1912, they would build about 180,000. So it's not an insignificant number. It's a revolver. It's a very late generation. It's one of the last military revolver designs, you know, brand new designs to be adopted. And it was into production quite late. The only oddities are kind of this more vertical grip, which on a automatic gun wouldn't be so weird, but on a revolver is a little bizarre for aiming. And of course, its cartridge was pretty unusual for that day and time for a revolver. But it was a good gun. It served them well. In fact, these could still be found in service as late as 1945 and thus the end of World War II. But of course, by that point, were pretty much in the hands of reservists and, and police, guard units, that kind of thing. But still, it's a good gun and high, you know, pretty high capacity, all things considered. Into the Great War, World War I, these were very much still in service. They were issued to officers, NCOs, artillery crews, uh, later vehicle drivers could be issued. Just basically anyone who doesn't need a, a firearm as their primary uh, device in the military could be issued one of these. And there's really some debate if any were actually made during World War I. It seems like maybe they weren't made from scratch, but they were built from leftover parts. And it seems like around maybe 20,000, 15, 20,000 were assembled from these parts during the war. Either way, they were very much in service and they were being refurbished through World War I. This is very, we know this. So even if they weren't building new guns, they were definitely refurbing older ones and keeping them in the front lines. So just a really interesting, neat revolver. Very well made, too. In the last in an era. Well, the 1898 Rossgasser was standard issue in the Hungarian army. Excuse me, the Austro-Hungarian army mostly in the Austrian part, although some were used in Hungary too, of course. The army cavalry wanted their own sidearm, and they were really interested in this newfangled auto-loading critter, which was coming onto the scene. A lot of the uh, Jorgi Luger stuff, Switzerland had adopted it in 1901. And of course, the U.S. military had been testing out auto loaders for some time, as well as many, many others. So, a quite famous and well-regarded Austrian designer, Karl or Karol Krinka, started working on a gun using a rotating barrel semi-lock breech system, and his first prototypes came out in 1904. And by 1906, he had submitted an improved version for the trials held by the cavalry. Essentially this gun here. Now we have another video on the Frommer guns from Hungary, and he also submitted a gun, but lost out to this here. It's an interesting gun. It was really well suited for the cavalry. It fires an 8x19 cartridge. So, same diameter as the Roth, excuse me, the uh, Rasgasser, but shorter. It's a rather large gun. We're just over 9 inches. But because of its operating system, it has a shorter barrel. It's about 5 inches. And we weigh right at 2 and a quarter pounds. So we're pretty heavy. Not going to lie. But they were already used to guns, and this was meant for cavalry use on horseback, so it wasn't necessarily on a person. The system it uses is very nice, though. Very interesting mechanically. This barrel rotates and grooves here to unlock this bolt that comes in the back. And this is fed from stripper clips at the top. Boop. 
that because of using this internal magazine system, early on, you know, today we would think, oh, you know, having a detachable mag is obvious. Then, though, there were some distinct advantages to internal magazines. For one, they held more cartridges. This holds 10 rounds, which was a large capacity for that day. If it was detachable, it would hold only 9 or maybe even 8. Also, the manufacturing technology at the time wasn't well suited to mass producing magazines. Magazines weren't as reliable, so it took more time and money and energy to make a good magazine. So only making one for a gun had some advantages in, in cost production. And also, there is a mag in this, but it's contained in the gun. It's protected. It's not going to get dented up, banged up, or lost. So your magazine is very secure and protected inside the gun. And then, of course, they would issue with these with stripper clips. And if you were good at loading it, you could, you know, recharge this gun quite quickly. Has a, has a release here. Now you notice it has a thing sticking out of the back. This is another interesting feature. Designed for cavalry use, we have kind of a partially cocked striker system, much like what Glock would come up with 50 some odd or even I guess 80 some odd years later, sorry, yeah. It's not a hammer, it's a striker. You pull back on your trigger, you see it coming back, and then you let go, pull all the way back, and there's even kind of a little stap here to make sure, are you sure? And then of course it's the dead trigger. So there's no other real safety on this gun per se, except for it having that trigger system, which is well suited for horseback. It's an interesting trigger because it's not heavy. It's actually quite light. There's this initial kind of little pull through here that's smooth, but a little heavy. Then you hit a break point. Hear that? And now you're kind of in a single action mode. You can let off. No harm and foul. You can redo it. And then if you're ready to fire, it's a very short, but still heavy, pull to fire. So I can see how that would be very useful on horseback, either while aiming so you don't accidentally let off a shot if you hit a rock, or just having the gun cocked and locked on the horse that's not going to accidentally go off, you would think. Interesting gun for an early auto loader, Much like the Frommer guns, this is all kind of a single piece frame, all machined together. Which by today's standards, even by that standard, that it was pretty expensive to produce. We have a lanyard bar on the bottom, fixed. Wood grips. Really interesting gun for its mechanics. And while it was expensive to produce, unlike the Frommer stop gun, this is actually quite robust and durable. It comes apart easily. Most of the parts are very large components. It's all pretty well sealed up. Though it's heavy, it's at least made of good solid steel. These actually performed exceedingly well in World War I. A really good attempt in an early, early autoloader. Although its 8 by 19 cartridge wasn't the best. It was a little anemic. It was okay for its day, but by today's standards, it would be considered quite light. And compared to, like, say, 9x19 and 45 ACP. But for an early cartridge, you get to remember at the time, the Luger cartridge was 7.65 Luger. So, you know, it is what it is. This would officially be adopted by the Army Cavalry in 1907, making it, and this is kind of a qualified statement, but it's worth pointing out, it was the first self-loading automatic pistol to be adopted by the land forces of a major power. And the reason you have to add those qualifiers, the Italian Navy adopted the broom handle Mauser before, and as I said, the Swiss adopted the Luger, although they're not, I guess, considered a major power. At least they weren't an aggressive power. Anyway, it still has a place in history as being a very early adopter in an autoloader. Now, while Carl Krinka designed this, initial work was done at a factory owned by Jorge Roth, and hence that's where Roth comes from. That was kind of where Krinka was working out of, you know, where he was working under. But the Roth factory did not have the production capacity to meet what the Austrian 
cavalry needed. So the manufacturing technology was transferred to Steyr, who would produce the first pistols in 1908 and build these through about 1913. Likewise, the what we know today as FEG factory, although it was under a different name back then, in Budapest, Hungary, would start up production in 1910 and manufacture these through about 1914. Now the majority of guns were made at Steyr. It's about 55,000, 54 some change, and another 34,000 and some chains were made at FEG. So still close, but Steyr still was trumping them about, you know, two-thirds. These were out of production for the time of World War I. However, they had turned out roughly 99,000 for the cavalry. And a few more would be used by the very fledgling Austrian Air Force so the pilots would have a safe gun to carry. So primarily used by the cavalry with small use by the uh, very young Austrian Air Force during World War I. And these would see a lot of use in the trenches. And while they would not make new guns, they would assemble a few more from leftover parts during the early stages of the war. And, but more importantly, they would refurbish many of these throughout the war to keep them in the, in the action. And they would... Um, you know, they would be very successful. In fact, other nations allied with Austria would use these, such as Italy. And later, some would find their way to places like Yugoslavia. After World War I and the separation of Austria and Hungary, Austria would keep on issuing these. In fact, they would do a pretty major refurbishment program running from about 1920 through 1926. They would refurbish, sometimes even redating these. They would refurb them, replace parts, yada yada, and keep them in service, issuing them right up until around 1938, and keeping them in reserve use until 1945. But of course, by this point, this is, this is the time when magazines were taking over, and of course, they were really out of date then. But a really neat gun and one of the first auto loaders to last as long as it did. Expensive to manufacture, but unlike a lot of guns that are expensive to manufacture, at least it was reliable. I mean, at least it um, worked. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just you know thinking about a lot of the other Frommers and a lot of the early designs. I mean, even the Luger is a little more complicated than this thing here. I really like it. It's, it's just a neat, weird gun. It feels really good in the hand. It's got kind of a swoop to the grip. The trigger is interesting. You get used to it really quick. And I just love how it harkens back to the Glock. But concealed carry, this is not. <laughs> but then again, when you're hanging this off a horse, it really doesn't matter. But a neat gun and a neat part of history that's not always remembered today. But it definitely served in both world wars. And our final gun, we're back to the so-called Steyr Hahn. Now, some people have said that Hahn means hammer in German. Others have commented that it actually just means cocked or cocking. Either way, it's kind of its nickname. And this has a, gun has a very interesting story, and it's really kind of the culmination of, of Steyr's pre-war automatic pistol work. This was developed at Steyr based on Karol Krinkov's design, kind of the rotating barrel system, pulling back, top loading with, with clips. But Steyr worked on it for several years, made it faster, easier to mass produce. A little more durable, reliable, just simpler, and that's why it's more of a blocky design. Now they were designing this with the Austrian army in, at large in mind, because they figured, well, the, the cavalry adopted the Rothsteyer, the 1907, maybe the whole army will want a general issue a pistol, a new automatic pistol, so they tried to make something more suited for general use, hence why we have just a hammer, as opposed to the unique firing system on the 1907. 
However, the Army really wasn't interested. When Steyer first showed this off around 1911, the Army said, thanks, but no thanks. They said, We're, we've got plenty of 1898s, and they've got about 180,000 at this point. And then they've got another 99,000 1907s. So they figured over two and three quarters handgun, uh, two and three quarter thousands handguns was enough. And to be fair, at this time, 1911, 1912, it's still peacetime. World War I is still some years off. Okay, fine. So, what Steyr did, they turned to the commercial market. And that's why this has the name of Model 1911. This is its commercial name. And it was predominantly chambered for a new cartridge, 9 by 23 Steyr. They kind of made the more powerful version of the Roth cartridge, the, the Krinka cartridge. This is much more potent. Actually, it's quite a nice potent cartridge for World War I. Today's standards, maybe not, but... It was, it was actually quite nice for that time. And this gun could take it. It's a very robust gun. Even more so than the 1907. It holds eight cartridges. It is again fed by stripper clips. It again uses the rotating barrel system developed by Krinka. So it's a semi-locked breech. It's more of a delayed blowback system. So of course it cocks its own little hammer. We have a manual safety here. I'm not really going to call this a browning style because it's kind of placed differently than what you would expect a browning to be. It's right here. And it can't go on when the hammer is back, which is kind of unique for this gun. It actually goes on when the hammer is up. This is also used as a slide lock. Put it up here. This is for loading. That way, when you press it down to load, you don't have it going forward. Of course, when you release, there it goes. Just an interesting system. No grip safety. That wasn't really an Austrian thing. Same lanyard ring as on the um, 1907. Wood panel grips. Interesting, these, these actually aren't screwed in. They actually slide into the frame with a screw on the bottom to hold them in, so they're kind of dovetailed in. I, just, I like the feel of this gun. It is solid. It weighs about the same as the 1907. We're a little bit shorter. We're at about eight and a half inches now, but we still have about a five inch barrel. The grip is more compact. We're a little, not, we're not quite as tall. Of course, we're only holding eight rounds instead of 10. And like I said, a more conventional trigger. And this assembly is quite neat because there's this cross pin here you take off and that separates the slide and frame. And it actually is pretty simple. Pretty neat gun. You can definitely tell this is kind of a later version in this family. And this really did achieve some success as a commercial gun. First in 1912, Chile in South America purchased 5,000 of these. Not bad. And then in 1913, Romania would purchase 25,000. So 30,000, not bad for a commercial gun. But still not really what Steyr had been hoping for. They were hoping for a big, fat Austrian military contract. Well, I guess fortunate for them, if not many other people, the next year the Great War began and the Austrian army realized that it did not have enough service sidearms to fight a major war and that, hey, this new automatic pistol thing was not a bad idea, but unfortunately the Roth Steyr was ending its production round. It already had ended at Steyr, and it was ending at FEG. So this gun here, the Steyr Hahn, didn't look so bad. They reevaluated it again. Keep in mind, they didn't initially reject it for any design issues. They just didn't think they needed it. 1914, they decided, uh, maybe we do need this. So they adopted it as the Model 1912. And this is its Austrian military designation, hence why it has two designations. And of course, Steyr would start cranking these guys out in World War I. 
They would be used by several allies and then in 1916 and then again in 1918 Imperial Germany would purchase roughly 15,000 in total in two contracts from Steyr making this a very you know one of the guns that got Steyr on the map as far as international and now, and now we're looking at nearly 50,000 guns sold outside of Austria not bad at all after World War II excuse me World War I these would remain in service. They had proven themselves very well in the trenches. Like I said, the 1907 did well. This did even better. And the more conventional hammer system and everything was nice. And it's a nice strong action with the reasonably powerful cartridge. So these were reissued after the war. Although manufacturing had ended, they would keep refurbishing these and reissuing them in Austria well through the 1930s. And actually in 1938, after the Anschluss with Germany, when the two nations were unified, around 60,000 were rebarreled for 9 by 19 Parabellum. And thanks to this rotating barrel system, it was a very easy conversion process. The Germans would just simply call this the Pistol, 1912. And so several would serve in Nazi Germany, but to be fair, with police more than military. And beginning in 1939 in Austria, the military would start to phase these out in favor of the new at the time Walther HP, Walther P-38. So in, by the 40s, more and more of these Walthers would start to appear, and these guns would be re resigned to second line reserve use, and mostly police use. And they were very good. It's interesting to point out that while a lot of the 1907s needed to be refurbished quite heavily in the 20s and 30s, when the Austrians reevaluated the Steyr Hahn guns in the inventory in the 30s, they actually found many of them were in um, acceptable condition still. They, they, they held up very well through World War I. Even this one here, being old, it, it feels good. Nice strong spring, reasonably smooth. Triggers on these are military, but a little better than the Roth, I'd say. Of course, you don't have the whole safety system built in. And a very successful gun. Of course, after World War II, most of these were pulled out of service because they were firing at that time a non-standard cartridge, and they would stay in service in places like Chile for a time and be around the world a bit here and there. But really their heyday was the early days of World War II and of course all the way through World War I. And this gave Austria its own thing. These were manufactured at Steyr exclusively. However, FEG would assemble some from Steyr parts and even make many parts themselves. So you'll see FEG marked Steyr Hans but at least some of the components are still made by Steyr, but assembled sometimes by FEG during World War I. Just neat guns, and I thought it was worth revisiting today. I, these are some of my favorite guns in my collection just because of how interesting and different they are. And when I picked any, all of these up, they really weren't expensive at all. Not at all. Today, I think they might have gone up a little bit, but still, they're not Nazi or anything, so that's really what gives the kind of the price tag to a lot of guns. But just thought we'd share. If you haven't checked it out already, we also have a video on Hungarian guns, and we have videos on the Steyr 1895 bolt action. We even have one on the, uh, on the MP34, the submachine gun that actually originally fired the same cartridge, 9x23, and was rebarreled like this to 9 by 19 during World War II. So we have some Austrian guns to check out. Or if you want to be really boring, you can always check out our Glock videos. Glocks are technically Austrian. Well, if you liked the video, we'd appreciate it if you click like and feel free to leave any comments below.
And if you'd like to help support us, please click on and check out the link to our Patreon page. This is Misha. And we'll catch you next time.